Hi, I'm Joe Saunders from Miniature Landscape Hobbies. In this episode, we're going to continue on on our series Painting Models from the Awesome Gale Force 9 game, Aliens, Another Glorious Day in the Core. Miniature Landscape Hobbies is proudly supported by these sponsors. In this example, we're going to be producing the models from the set known as the Ultimate Badasses. Hey, Rick, don't worry. Me and my squad of Ultimate Badasses will protect you. <laughs> this is a great set of seven models, which adds additional Colonial Marines and the treacherous corporate Stooge Burke. It's pathetic. To your list so that you can play these dynamic characters and use all their special abilities in the game. Painting the Colonial Marines is really something of a challenge. You see, these models have a lot of different colors in them, mainly because their armor has camouflage. One of the difficulties when painting a miniature is making camouflage seem visually interesting. Camouflage colors are, out of necessity, kind of dark, and kind of dull, and designed to blend together. This, of course, really causes a problem on your miniatures because they look just bland, and you really need a lot of contrast to pull off a really exciting and visually interesting model. In this video, I'm going to take you through my methodology of creating these models in a way that looks great on the tabletop, but still looks like proper warriors from the future. Now we've said all that, let's get down to business and start painting. I'd like to take a quick moment to thank my Patreon supporters. Without their assistance, miniature landscape hobbies would not be possible. If you would like to learn more about the benefits of becoming a Patreon supporter, please check the link in the video description. After building the Colonial Marines from the set, I get ready to prime them. Already at this point, a painter has to make an important decision. If my objective was to use acrylic layering to paint a pwn in the gang, I'd likely just spray them down with a black primer. But since I intend to use speed paints, I need underpainting to build the transparent colors on. Because of this, I mix a light gray with black primer to make a medium gray and apply this by airbrush. Please note that I had these colors on hand, and since it's a small batch of models, I elected to airbrush these. But if this was a big batch of figures, say 10 or more, I would have used a suitable gray rattle can spray paint. After the primer had dried, I grabbed my light gray MIG Dio dry brush paint and dry brushed the model to pick out the raised details. I then followed up with white also Dio Dry Brush. This awesome product is more of an acrylic gel than a regular paint, so it creates nice smooth dry brush layers and minimizes chalkiness. If you're unfamiliar with it, you should really give it a try. Now the whites and grays are done, and I have underpainted my zenithal layers, which imply shadows on the deeper areas and direct light on the upper layers. Now I could move to the ever-so-awesome Army Painter Speed Paints. Getting out Absolution Green, I block in the armored areas on each Marine. Since I have the zenithal underpainting finished, I let the contrast speak for itself as the translucent speed paint dries. One thing to note is that Absolution Green is brighter than the deep olive you see on the Marines in the movie. This is intentional. The smaller the subject you're painting, the more you have to artificially lighten it in order to imply that the 30mm tall model is large enough to reflect a significant amount of light or cast a shadow. One of the major tasks of the miniature painter is to exaggerate the shades and highlights in order to establish mass and scale. The fabric areas are next, and these get a quick layer of pallid bone. Again, this is lighter than the fatigues in the movie, but we need to work in lighter tones to imply we're working with a 6 foot tall wire, not a 2.5 inch tall chunk of plastic. Now I can move on to the camouflage itself. 
If I were to paint the actual camo from the movie, the effects would be too fine to show. And since camo colors generally are muted shades, we need to use more dramatic hues and bolder patterns. This will still look like camouflage to the viewer, but not actually break up the lines of the model, which would diminish visual interest. First, I start with Calvary Brown, which is really kind of a rust red. This goes on in lines and blotches more or less at random over the green armor sections. I now follow up with German Orange Okra, which is kind of a mustard orangey yellow. This gets applied the same way as the Calvary Brown does. The main camo pattern is now down, so it's time to revisit the armor itself. Why? Well, I love my Army Painter speed paints. They really do build contrast with one coat. To get this from traditional acrylics, the same effect would take at least three layers. However, I find that at wargaming scales, one more highlight is in order to take the speed paints from good to great. So I mix two to three drops of Absolution Green into regular ivory paint and use this as a highlight. Taking a small brush, I pick out the extreme edges of the armor and any prominent details. I find that when this dries, the combo of traditional acrylics and speed paint blends quite nicely into the underlying colors. Now in the movie, the fatigues under the marine armor have a very busy camo pattern that's totally different from the armor. This looks cool on film, but on a miniature it would clutter the model making it unreadable to the viewer. So like the armor, rather than paint a true camo pattern, I just imply it by applying random blotches of desolate brown. This pretty much finishes the tough work with the camo, so now I move on to the flesh tones. When it comes to skin, I find that layering the old fashioned way is probably better than speed paints. So I go this way on the Colonial Marines. First, I need a dark warm skin tone, so all the skin gets painted hull red. Now I carefully paint the skin with luminous flesh, leaving the hull red showing in the deepest areas. My philosophy as a painter is that skin tones should get special attention as they draw the viewer's eye, especially when it comes to the face, so I now layer in a very small highlight of light flesh targeting the prominent areas like the knuckles, large muscles, forehead, cheeks, and chin. For flesh tones to work, they need to be unified, so everything now gets a wash of flesh wash from Army Painter. To cap the skin off, when the wash is dry, I go back to light flesh and apply the smallest highlights back on the nose, chin, forehead, and knuckles of each model. Before we finish up on skin tones, I must mention that Sergeant Apone is African American. When it comes to speed paints, I find that black skin tones are a lot easier to do than Caucasian ones. Slightly thinned warrior skin is applied over a light flesh undercoat, and that's all that's required for a really good effect. Now it's time to handle the straps and webbing. I simply paint these with brownish decay. Small, highly textured details like the webbing is perfect for speed paint. Paint gathers in the low areas and only tints the higher areas, and since the details are small and not a major focus of the piece, extra highlighting is not needed. The polymer exterior of the Colonial Marine weapons is kind of a brownish olive. I decided to switch this up to make the equipment a little more obvious though. So I mixed 50-50 malignant green with camo cloak and brushed it on. This looked great, but it was just a little short on the contrast. So I added some deck tan to this and gave an extreme edge highlight on all of the guns. The metallic parts of the weapons, numerous pouches, and boots of the marines are all basic black. Dealing with these couldn't be more straightforward. Each got blocked in with a single coat of grim black. Again, speed paints might need extra highlights on large or particularly prominent areas, but these small black details do just fine with one layer. The models now look great, 
but a few small touches are in order. The first thing is lining in. This is the process of tracing the equipment and borders of the clothing on a model to build even more contrast. To do this, I mix 50-50 black acrylic ink in Airbrush Flow Improver. Then I use a small brush and just go ahead and start painting. Don't get me wrong, this process is time consuming, but the extra definition it imparts to a model is striking. And so in the end, it's worth it. At this point, I decided I wanted a couple extra splashes of color to build interest. So I pick out the camera lens and the shoulder lamp on each marine with a dot of white paint. The lamp then gets filled in with tidal wave blue and the camera lens gets bright red. All that's left now are the bases. I start by repainting them straight black. The metal grating on the base then gets dry brushed rough iron, followed by a plate mail. Finally, the name of each model is carefully picked out in white. This pretty much finishes the models, but these are destined to be game pieces and will be handled a lot. So I spray them down with a couple coats of satin varnish and a final single coat of matte varnish. The satin is hard wearing to protect the model while the matte layer counters the shine and makes the figures easier to photograph. And with this, the project is complete. Now I have the Colonial Marine Squad all ready to go. The camouflage looks good, but doesn't disrupt the visual interest, and I think the character of each model is readily apparent. The final results may not be display quality, but they're good enough to turn some heads on the table and provide a worthy opponent to the xenomorphs. So now I can invite my friends over and begin a rescue mission for Hadley's Hope. Or is it a bug hunt? If you'd like to learn how to paint the xenomorphs from the movie Aliens, please watch this video. Or consider watching this other video instead. Thanks for watching, and as always, remember to keep building life in miniature.